All right, so welcome to tonight's conversation. Uh, the, the conversation was billed as pandemic keepers, uh, which admittedly, this is a term I stole from my wife. Uh, I did not invent it. Uh, I should give credit to her. She is a historian, not a physicist. Um, but uh, she was asking me this the other day, you know, what have you learned this last year that is actually valuable enough that you want to keep doing it? So I thought for fun, just because I haven't used it in a while, I made up a quick little poll of pandemic keepers and pandemic leavers. Uh, and I'm curious your opinions of these. So we can start that and we can use that to, to spur our conversation. So feel free to vote on these. I'm curious of your opinions. I'm assuming you can see them. Can you see them? It's been a while since I've done this. Did I do it right? Okay. Got a lot of variation, that's good. All right, I'll give you another 60 seconds. All right, here's what we got. Online office hours, looked like a narrow keeper. What do we think about this? Has this been, those of you that said, said lever, why? Or those of you said keeper, why? I'm curious. It's certainly much less efficient. True. I think I think there are people who come who wouldn't come otherwise, right? So I think that's there's a plus and minus there, but it's much harder to help people. I think they're holding a sheet of paper up in front of their camera, and I'm trying to read it, right? It doesn't really work that well. I might do one a week online ops hours. I have I haven't really decided yet. Yep, Deborah. Uh, I said it was a keeper because uh, exactly what Drew mentioned. I think I, I got a lot more people coming to office hours. Uh, and maybe that was partly because they were starved for interactions. And, and this was one option for interactions during the pandemic. But um, I found like uh, usually there was some electronic version of whatever the assignment was that, that could put, we could share screen and the student could be annotating on and we could talk that way. I'm learning to use the Zoom annotation with an iPad and that kind of replaces the paper pencil thing. Um, so I thought that was good. Right, Marianne? Um, yeah, we uh, had, um, we had, uh, like I, I taught a class of 300 people and uh, with lots of uh, GTA help. And we had way more people coming to the online office hours than would ever come to the regular office hours. But we gave our GTAs, uh, if they didn't have already iPads with pens or computers with pens. And so that was, they, they could pretty much work like they would work on a blackboard or, or on a piece of paper on it. So that made a big difference. 
Yeah, I, I will say this has come up already. Um, my my iPad and pen is I, I could not have survived without being able to write on that and, and have that display. That is, an, for me, that is definitely a keeper. Uh, Zachary, looks like there's two people there. Uh, hi, I'm Rafi, but since we're in the same room, there's no point in having two cameras and two mics. Um, so uh, I put keeper, but I do kind of agree that it somewhat depends. Uh, based on my experience interacting with undergrads, they really, um, a lot of them appreciate having the option of having a virtual office hours. Uh, I don't think it's something that they, if you had to choose between the two that they would do, but having the accessibility of like, oh, I have this one question and I can, you know, just go online. I don't even have to leave my apartment or my wherever I'm studying. I think it's a, it's a nice advantage uh, that definitely would be worth keeping. All right, Doris, you've been waiting patiently. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I chose Keeper because uh, I interviewed several female students in our physics courses. And some of them said that they liked the online office hour because uh, it gives them lower pressure, um, especially when there are a lot of um, guys in the office hour, in the real office hour. When the instructor was the male instructor and the, all the other students are guys and they feel, oh, I'm the only female in this room. So they feel a little nervous asking question, but when it's online, it's like uh, she or uh, those female students didn't realize how many people are here, are boys or something. And um, it's kind of like a nice thing for them. And another female student mentioned that if they really want to go, they just hit the button, leave the room. They do not need to say, oh, I, I want to go or interrupt the other people. So it's like lower pressure and uh, it's more flexible. And I also heard something uh, from students. They said that uh, in the online office hour, you can hear what other people are asking um, and uh, very clear, like not like in the real room, if the person very close to the instructor, they may hear more from the instructor while people like just uh, at the gate may not hear a lot of stuff. So I think it's a good thing to keep. Yeah, so when you did office hours, what was, did people generally have one-on-one -on -one office hours or like groups of people is what it seems like you're describing? Uh, it's like uh, the instructor set an uh, office hour and the instructor will just uh, stay in this office hour in this Zoom and uh, um, students just come in and uh, the, the, the instructor will answer the question like one by one as the order who comes first gets the first chance to ask. So I think it's very organized too. All right, Mary. Am I saying that, Miriam? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I said uh, Keeper uh, because I can use it during the weekend too. And uh, I'm using Remind. So uh, my students are not shy to send me texts uh, very late at night. So I can, <laughs> sometimes I go uh, online uh, like very late at night to answer their question. So yeah, it's, uh, I feel like uh, they're using uh, more during the, uh, this virtual mode. Yeah, the, um, the off hours thing actually is an interesting question. And by no means am I trying to imply that um, some of you are skirting your duties, but the idea that uh, you don't have to go into your office either, <laughs> is that beneficial? <laughs> You know, uh, being able to do it from your home uh, rather than driving however long your commute is to your office uh, to be there. Definitely, or it, it's easier to also arrange for travel and still be able to be, you know, responsible to your teaching assignment. Sure. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Most popular office hours is in the chat. Uh, most popular office hours was on a Sunday. Uh, which, by the way, I jumped into our conversation much faster than I usually do. Uh, 
would if if you have to take a second, could you all introduce yourselves in the chat and maybe send where you are? We there's a lot of repeat people which I know, and but there's also it's good to make sure everybody else knows where people are from. So I, I apologize for jumping in on that one. All right, what about recording lectures? This one has been a hot topic of debate for me and the people that I work with. Recording your lectures to post later. This one was a little closer about keeping or leaving. And a lot of depends, <laughs> a lot of depends. Aren't we all like perfect technologically now? We can set up webcams and like hit the record button in 30 seconds or less. I just don't want to have to watch them afterwards. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, I'm, I'm less excited about watching myself too. I, I agree. And my jokes are never funny the second time through. Drew. Yeah, I mean, I'm not really interested in recording anything. I mean, I think, you know, in, you know I'm teaching in a you know, monstrous classroom sometimes, doing demonstrations, turning lights on and off. I, mean, I think someone's gonna have to man the video camera to make sure the thing actually is visible. You know, and, and I also don't wanna encourage students not to come to class. I mean, I think that's really what I wanna avoid as well. So yeah, I definitely not recording anything. Mm -hmm. Gary, what have you discovered? Yeah, but, but I've, I haven't discovered it yet because we really haven't been doing it yet because all of the stuff has been delivered online from home really here, all of the, medium-sized stuff, a lot of it asynchronously rather than as live lectures as well, you know, maybe some live components thrown in too. But when people are back on campus, it's quite different. The dynamic is quite different. That in a sense, what you're delivering, if you're delivering the stuff totally online is nearly, you know, one-dimensional or two-dimensional. Whereas if you're trying to deliver it in class to a, a group of students and there's another group of students maybe trying to catch it or catch a recording of it, um, which, you know, I don't know, at our university, rooms are being kitted out all right for it, but mainly to capture audio and to capture the, you know, capture slides or whatever is appearing on the data projector. You know, it could be, you could be using a smart pen or something like that as well on it. But it's quite different. The you know, what, what was being done up until now in the emergency end of things was purpose, you know, purposely and deliberately to deliver online. You know, whereas if you're mixing the two, it's a much more difficult ask to get it right. It's difficult to get it right for people that are there, you know, in the presence. The other difficulty too is, you know, how do you deal with, let's say you've got, you know, you're going through something, you'd start maybe have students breaking out doing things for 10 minutes. Um, you've got students that are actually either watching a video or recording, twiddling their thumbs for the 10 minutes, probably not doing because there's nobody to interact with anyway. So it's a very different dynamic. So I think it's very much a depend. But the feedback we've been getting here definitely is that students, especially students with access issues, or students with disabilities, or students with learning disabilities in particular as well, find recordings very useful because they can access them from where they are. But as well as that, the students with learning disabilities or students with, who, for whom English isn't the first language also find it very useful to be able to, you know, play back things several times, maybe a difficult part of the lecture. So I think it's, I think it's very, very much a depend. Mm. All right, Deborah. Yeah, I was going to resonate with what uh, Gary just said. Um, I felt initially like Drew, uh, that I don't want to discourage students from attending. But in fact, I think it has solved more problems with attendance because I don't think it's that fun to watch online lectures. They're not, you know, edited. They take a long time. You have to kind of scroll around to find the salient part. So I don't think that students will do it that much. Um, if they can avoid it. But I think for students who get sick or have some other issue, it, it makes it kind of very natural to say, well, the lecture's online, go watch it, then ask questions sort of thing. It, it simplifies. So could one of the depends category be, you just default to recording everything, but you don't post it unless a student requests it? I 
I don't know. I think I just have it up there in general, minimize sort of the requests that are administrative like that and let the students, you know, ask questions about it. All right, Marianne. Well, I have reasonable statistics because I taught about 320 people of which 45 had a live lecture. Some had actual face-to-face -face labs, but most of them, most of the others were totally online. And I posted recordings of the lectures, edited actually with captions, and I posted the lecture slides, edited, and I had a lot of web materials asynchronous. Nobody watched the whole lecture. They used Panopto video and I can see exactly. Some were watched the first five minutes, but nobody watched any lecture totally through. But they all said the slides that were then annotated where I added some stuff that I said during the lecture that came up that I annotated in the slide. They were very useful, but nobody watched the video. <laughs> I, I, it's on Panopto, you can see the statistics and I can see some started watching it, but after about five minutes, they stopped. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, the, uh, the 10 minutes or less is, is an interesting um, research on that. Uh, I, I haven't read into that as much as I probably should, but it, I think I've heard uh, somewhere. Yes, Jonathan, thanks for joining by the way. So uh, I don't know, initially I had some of the same concerns about like attendance. No one would come if I recorded everything, but uh, I've actually noticed the opposite. I had, I had better attendance online synchronously than I, I did you know, asynchronously, or sorry, than I did face-to-face. -face. Uh, but I've just recorded everything from the synchronous sessions and I dropped them you know, on Canvas and the students, some of them watch them just because they want it for the second time. Uh, some of them you know, do miss, but I don't have anyone who's really consistently missing and making up for that, you know, except for a odd student here or there with this tr extreme uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. But recording lectures when we go back to face-to-face -to -face fills a gap that we had before this, which was when students missed, I mean, all they had was they had to go get notes from somebody uh, or I, you know, my notes, they didn't have any context for things. And so trying to record this is gonna kind of fill that gap because we also have them do reflections, write a little reflection on some of the, the instable question or the in-class questions we give. And the students actually do that uh, for the most part with, you know, they do well on it or they put real thought into what they write. And so it's, it's closing this gap for those that are missing. Uh, it's gonna be more onerous on me because now I have to use the dot cam uh, to write my notes. I can't use the blackboard and do all my gesticulating at the blackboard, but I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice that uh, to, help students who miss class. Zach, or Zachary, or Zach. Zach. Uh, I think one of the, the key features that, like, uh, like Marianne was kind of saying, you know, there's only these five to 10 minutes of watching. I think one of the things that like would really benefit from having a recorded lecture is, uh, you know, a way to very quickly navigate to the information within the lecture that you are looking for. Like YouTube has had this new feature, I think during the pandemic where you can kind of like chapterize your, your video. And then so you can jump to a particular chapter and get that information. And so I feel like if you were able to add that feature somehow to your video, that would really, that's a lot of work, but you know that could help people continue to watch it because then they could go, oh, I forgot, you know, how we derived that one equation. Let me go to the part where you discussed how to drive that one equation. Yeah, I think you know. It's a, do you think it changes the way students take notes if they know that there's a, a video that they could go refer to? Do they? Are they? Are they more or less passive as they sit there and listen to you talk? You know, are they writing things down or are they just watching and absorbing? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I guess for my personal, uh, you know, like teaching philosophy is I feel like I'm not a big fan of the lecture in general. Um, I'm, I'm, I think kind of more of a, 
like either like flipped classroom or a uh, uh, like group work within the class is a, a better learning center. Like we, we have one of our uh, lecturers on, on campus. That's the way he was running his classes pre-pandemic. He recorded everything. They watched that at home for homework and then they did classwork together in the classroom. So I guess for me, I'm more of that regard anyway. So I'm not sure how much I would put on whether they took notes or not. But to answer that, I think they probably are gonna take less notes. <laughs> whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is. Yeah, hard. yeah, but, but they may not be a bad thing. Um, uh, Gary has an interesting comment in the chat about rules in the European Union about posting accessibility uh, information and, and um, captioning things. Um, I could see how, you know, having everything be captioned and be accessible uh, definitely adds a layer of post-production time. Yeah, I think people reckon it's totally unimplementable and the irony was in Ireland it was signed into law right in the middle of the COVID period when the amount of recorded material that was being provided, I don't know, went up probably about a factor of 10 so the way it is at the moment that people people aren't able to, you know, do it really. And the other thing too as well is that um, the captions are supposed to be checked out. So, you know, automatic captions doesn't work particularly well in physics. Um, <laughs> so you end up with an awful lot of things. Like, you know, you try a particle physics lecture in, in you know, Google Chrome with the captioning turned on and you'll, you'll have fun. Yeah, I've, I've, I've played around with Google um, as the video link and uh, the audio, ca the captioning on that is, is entertaining to watch during a physics lecture. Drew. I just want to comment on that. We, we certainly had some students that with disability resources that their Zoom lectures had to be captioned correctly. So after, after the sort of automatic captioning, someone had to go through and check everything. I don't know how well that worked because none of them were in my class, but I just heard about them indirectly. I'm sure it was... I mean, it, it must have meant waiting an extra day or two to get the class visible, right? Which is just not convenient necessarily. Nope. So I'm sure there were a lot of problems with it. Yeah, I, the uh, the Zoom captioning. I haven't had experience with Zoom captioning, but my my wife actually had uh, a, a couple deaf students in her course, and she had uh, Zoom signers that would sign in. Uh, and then sign for her her uh, her course, which was interesting. Yeah, the script. Uh, anyone play? There's a good one. Uh, there's a lot of those free um, uh, teleprompter apps that just kind of scroll on your screen in the background. Anyone played with one of those? And then you can read exactly. I played around with those a little bit, but. It was too distracting to have words flashed across my screen. Yeah, for some of our virtual labs or you know, video labs that we did, we actually, uh, I didn't use this, but my colleague uh, bought like a teleprompter that goes, mounts onto the end of a camera and then you put your phone there and it kind of acts like a, you know, what a news anchor would see. So sure. he was able just to read it, his script off as he was, you know, demonstrating the lab and showing students things. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, maybe this becomes a new work study is write captions to your, your lectures. <laughs> All right, so here's the one, the, the, the first two questions were just warm ups for this one. And this is the real question of the night. Online labs. Yes or no? And we split straight down the middle on this one. <laughs> Who wants to jump into this morass first? Deborah, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is why I was excited to join the coffee hour. I, I actually became an AAPT member to join the AAPT meeting this summer to share about what we've done with our labs. And I am interested in, you know, feedback about whether or not this is keeper or not. What we did, um, especially specifically for uh, modern physics labs, where your uh, students are executing 
uh, things like the photoelectric effect experiment or atomics, measuring atomic spectra, things where they can't really do it with kit that you might send them or they might just find at home. Uh, we, we, we remotified the apparatus that we had. We basically attached stepper motors to the knobs so that they could turn them by clicking on their website, a website and, and put a webcam looking at the actual experiment so that they could just read the data off of the screens on the meters, off the meter displays, just the way they would, would do if they were in person. And uh, we've been running the class that way. And, um, and I, I chose depends on this because I think it's neat and, and rep reproduces a lot of the experience, but I don't know um, if it has, you know, value outside of a pandemic situation, because I think that, you know, playing around with equipment is, is key. The question in the chat is how many students, and right now this quarter, we're serving about 200 students in this way. Uh, we've, we've, we've had to remotify uh, 10 apparatus, two for each of five labs, and so that every three hour section can accommodate 10 students. And then we have 12 sections in a week. And then we have students alternating weeks. And that's how we got up to 240 slots that are now filled by about 200 students. And um, yeah, it's interesting. And I'm actually also curious whether if we have done this to an apparatus that say you don't have at your institution, would you want to have your students do it remotely on our apparatus and, and see how that goes, that kind of thing. So uh, which apparatus, apparati, I think is the term, did you uh, hook up in this way? Can I share my screen and show? Would that uh, absolutely. absolutely, but let me just open it. Yep, you're good. Okay, uh, let me see. I'll just... Uh, share everything and then come into the website here. Uh, so we have a website that students usually access this through our Moodle or through our course management software, but there's a website where you can go to. And these are the five uh, apparatus that we remotified. So the photoelectric effect, atomic spectra, the Frank Hertz experiment, diffraction interference, and radiation absorption. Um, and this is with Zach and Rafi who are there. They, they were super key in making this happen. Um, and there are students on the apparatus right now uh, and will be up until 10 p.m. tonight. So it's not easy to show to you working, but I can just show you what it looks like. Um, if, a, if a student goes, uh, onto photo one, this is what they see, but they get the error that somebody's using the apparatus right now. Um, and in this um, blank region here is the live feed from a webcam that, um, that lets them see the apparatus. It's so much more effective when you can actually see the apparatus, but in that live feed, you have these two Keithleys and each one of the buttons on these Keithleys you can click here on the website and it actually pushes the button effectively like through RS-232. It, it, so they can you know, go and do all sorts of things that they don't even need to do just like they could in person, um, manipulating the Keithleys and maybe find it useful to use the user manual. And then they can click on the filters to put those different filters in place in front of the lamp which they can turn on and off and they can adjust the potentiometer that changes the voltage uh, it's so much better when you can actually see the apparatus. So I can ping the TA um, and, and see if somebody is willing to come off for a few minutes, if that's interesting. I, I don't wanna dominate the whole conversation, but I'm super excited about what we did. And, and to the person who asked about write-ups, we do have lab manuals, uh, sort of like lab guides that go on with each experiment. And, um, and if, you, if you wanna have a look at those, you can go to this. Um, website, we ask that uh, you, you get a password in order to see them. Uh, so you just have to do, oops, I don't know. Well, here it'll just open up for me, but 
it might ask you for a password, in which case you just send a little request through that um, right here through the questions or comments and we'll send you the password. We just kind of wanna know how many people are finding it useful. Um, but the write-ups, you know, they do a little introduction also to what the student will see on the remote lab and then um, have the student execute certain exercises and answer questions and kind of guide them all the way through like you might in, in an in-person lab. Um, so that's what we've done. And I guess I'm kind of curious whether this has any life beyond the pandemic, what you guys might think. We did something like that about probably 15 years ago, probably not as, as um, involved, but we had atomic spectra and we had gamma ray spectroscopy. And we made it open to anybody, um, but there was no pandemic. So it wasn't really catching, <laughs> catching on. And then the apparatus broke and we only had one apparatus. That's uh, like, it was kind of limited as far as scheduling, you had to, well, that was one of the thing. How did you schedule it? We just said, if somebody uses it, you have to wait until it's free and then it's, but we certainly, I mean, if something is that is available and you make, you have many apparatus and they available to other institutions to use if they buy into it, we would be interested. We thought that was great, but it eventually the equipment broke and we didn't, since there was not enough interest, we gave up on it. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's what we uh, were told would happen is the equipment would break. And, and we, so somebody asked, oh, look, Rafi. Rafi, I don't know if you can see, he's showing the, one of the apparatus right now. Um, yeah. That's our Frank Hertz apparatus, if you want to pin that video to, to see it a little bit better. Um, was, that, was that the FUVA Frank Hertz apparatus? FUVA? Uh, it's a German, did you get it from a German company? It looks familiar to me, that's why. Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely German. Uh, yeah, it looks like FUVA, very good. It's blurry, but it's got the E-W-E in there that probably corresponds. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you'll notice, but we've got the potentiometers attached to stepper motors. And maybe you can see um, there's, uh, there's right. some eye pairs that make the stepper motor, the belts kind of work better. That's what those 3D printed parts are. The gray things are 3D printed parts. That I think makes the difference now between 15 years ago, Marianne, where 3D printing is really cheap and, and easy. And so you can custom adapt things much more easily maybe than you could back then. There's also super cheap, high quality webcams. So this particular apparatus has four webcams on it to see uh, the equipment from the various perspectives. Um, I don't know, can you show us the webcams, Rafi, or Zach, or whoever's out there? Um, I think all of the labs are in use. So yeah, but just, really but just raise your window a little oh, bit oh, so you can see them. To the camera, yeah. So, that, so, so there's a camera looking at the, yeah. You yeah. narrate. There. I don't know. Well, so yeah, we have basically four different four cameras on the yeah, Frank Hertz experiment so that you can see the, the filament and our variac for the oven as well as all the knobs and then a, a final camera so you can see the um, electrometer and the power supply. So all the labs have cameras so that you can see like all the relevant parts of the lab. And, and key is you don't get your data through the computer. You have to write it down, <laughs> right? So the students are doing the same kind of note taking and observing as they would be doing in person. It's not automated data taking, uh, it's very manual. So somebody in the chat asked how long it took to, and how much it cost. Um, we already had this equipment. We have a dozen instances of each of these for our typical labs. So we just took two and not counting the cost of those uh, pieces, it was 10K to do the 10 apparatus. So about $1,000 per apparatus to get the Raspberry Pi that controls it and all the um, stepper motors and 
control boards for those and the cameras and its control board and stuff like that. Um, and also we happen to already have the 3D printer. So I'm not counting the cost. Uh, I mean, the cost of the filament or the plastic is trivial. So I'm not counting the cost of the printer, but it's definitely within budget for us and it has allowed us to move our pandemic cohort sort of along in their curriculum. Uh, so we think it was worth it, but I could understand why might not want to invest otherwise. Um, and then how long did it take? Um, we conceived of the idea at the beginning of the pandemic and we had four apparatus, two instances of each of four apparatus ready to go and used in the end of um, mid-July. So I guess that's March, April, May, June, about four, four and a half months um, to get those four things worked out. Uh, but there was a team of, you know, uh, those, these two guys, Zach and Rafi and myself working on it. This is our, our gamma apparatus. This one is the one that just recently came online. It was the hardest to uh, remotify, as we call it. Um, it has uh, this actuator, sort of a, a kind of very primitive robotic arm for moving the absorbers into position in the Geiger counter. Um, and that's been a little harder to make robust and, and user friendly. Gary, you have your hand up. Did you have a yeah, question? Yeah, I got a question. Uh, with the high school, have you ever thought of using these after pandemic as recruiting tools for high school? When you get a high school class online, they can go through a pretty complex experiment and, and use it as a recruiting tool. You know, hey, would you like to come to our university? Oh, I love that idea. I would love to make it a recruiting tool for, for great high school students. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. But would you think that high school students would be, you know, ready to appreciate these experiments? I think there's a few of them that definitely could, uh, you know, like maybe the, like, like a photoelectric effect, some of these things, some things they may have heard about or whatever, but to actually do an experiment, I mean, even if it's remote, yeah, might be, uh, I said, if you had the teacher who could prep them ahead of time, good enough, uh, I think it might work. Yeah, I, that, I agree. That, that is the thing. Um, it, it's, you know, we have our administrators saying, can we, can we do this afterwards, you know, sort of save and, and continue to offer labs online. Uh, you'd think it might be somewhat saving and maybe in space, it's a little uh, of a savings, but you do need to have, I think, a, a better student teacher ratio to, to get a good learning experience with the online apparatus. We have one uh, graduate teaching assistant instructor for 10 students at a time and that kind of works, but I don't think you could scale up beyond that all that easily. Terry, you have a question? Yeah, I'm just a comment about what uh, Gary said. Mm -hmm. um, I, about 30 years ago, I started running uh, labs for high school students in, in the university labs. And we, uh, I got up to about, we have about 1500 P, uh, students come through in a, in a semester. And one of the things that the, some of the teachers were really upset about was that they had to travel long distances, like more than five hours away to get to the university. And I tried to get some of the labs, uh, adapted uh, for, we have E over M apparatus and we were trying to send up the E over M, uh, the old Sergeant Welsh ones. And uh, we tried to get them uh, hooked up on, on uh, uh, that time it was uh, LabVIEW. And that was uh, the biggest thing was the cost for us uh, at that point was the LabVIEW uh, licensing and that sort of stuff. And, and use a web server to use virtual instruments on the, uh, on the E over M apparatus. But the students do love it. The students really do like that type of thing, working on a big real apparatus. Cool. Rafi, did you want to add something? Um, yeah, I just had, uh, I just wanted to mention, because we've, uh, you know, Deborah and Zach and I have talked about like the going few, uh, forward with these labs and seeing, you know, where they can go. And one of the things that we talked about was, the fact that having these labs are, is very helpful for 
accessibility. We, we mentioned this when we were talking about the office hours online. You know, if there's a student, they can't make it to lab or they don't have time to finish the lab in a given period, uh, they can log on to these at any point in time. You know, they can go to a Sunday lab catch up section if they need it or something like that. Maybe it's not worth building it from scratch for that, but like since we already have it, you know, that's a consideration as well. Yeah. Our students, actually, I could share our, um, our calendar. The students can contact their TA and book time on the equipment at any hour. And since a fair number of our students are in China or India at very different time zones, sometimes they find it more convenient to get on in the wee hours. Marianne? Yeah, I just wanted to say that there's an enormous interest in online classes with online labs. For example, next fall in, at our university, we're going to have full face-to-face -face lectures again, but we're offering online sections. And both for the physics majors and for the life science majors, at least one third of the people want the fully online class with fully online labs. If they can choose, they choose that one. They have the choice between face-to-face -face with face-to-face -face labs and face-to-face -face lectures or fully asynchronous online and they choose fully asynchronous online. <laughs> so there's an enormous interest in that because there's so many students that now uh, are working or have other time constraints that they're really looking for that online option. So maybe this would be um, useful that way. I don't know that as a university, we want our students not to come in, but I can understand making it more accessible. Mark, what did you want to say? Uh, just as another extension to this, I think it's great. And I, and I think um, as a high school teacher, having access to this thing would be very valuable. And I think it would be really good for your recruiting. Um, I think it would be really good for the teachers themselves to also learn the experiments and learn this. And I think there's value even in, in teacher training type things that could occur out, around this. Um, but the other thing I was wondering is, is now that the three of you have, have done this with 10 machines, um, it seems like there also might be a learning opportunity for some of your undergraduates to continue to make other machines uh, do this. Uh, and, and you can start to parallelize this process even more uh, by involving others and, and the learning process of doing that has value. Definitely, we're, we're all about that. Uh, we're trying to figure out a way to get our own undergraduates involved. Like Marianne had said, you know, these things might break down. They're gonna take a certain amount of, of uh, human capital to maintain. And those undergraduates would be the right people to do that job uh, if they can be appropriately, you know, trained up and supervised, deployed um, because it, they really learn from it and maybe make it you know, more accessible. We also have a, a, a problem with a large undergraduate population that doesn't have a lot of access to research opportunities because of a, relatively small faculty. And then this gives them a different opportunity to get into the lab and start developing some of those skills. Um, I, it also seems like uh, this might be a way to, and this is a terrible thing to say out loud, uh, poach students from other departments, right? You've got your computer science majors that you, you could turn into physics majors uh, by pulling them in and saying, you know what, we need some control, we need Raspberry Pi experts to do this, right? Um, and, and I'm sure the fact that I'm recording this will be great. <laughs> We've been trying to poach our engineering majors since I got here and it works a little bit. Um, I think that um, our problem right now is we have a few too many physics majors. <laughs> so we have the opposite problem that way, but it, it's, uh, it's good. I'm gonna put the website to it in the chat so you guys can go have a look and you know, share it with other folks that you think would find it interesting and you know, let us know about your interest and you know, help prompt us to, um, to do something valuable with it going forward. I will say that you know, students kind of, um, many students say this, this is great that you did this for the pandemic, but we really look forward to being back in person. And so I, I, I'm hoping that we'll have uh, interest and maybe that interest will just be off campus. Did you have something else to add, Mark? I was, I was just gonna ask about the website, Saxophone. Where did that come from? 
that, that's a not totally our true. RIT guy. He's been slowly naming the different servers on campus, various chilies, peppers, and now various musical instruments. And we just got saxophone. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. So trying to come up with a good one was too hard. I thought there was some online saxophone they could play too. <laughs> I'm not sure. No. Did you have something else you wanted to add, Zach or Rafi? Your hand's still up. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, you know, to, to go back to the original questions, is it a keeper or not? We tried, uh, you know, a lot of different approaches to all of our lab classes. And I guess in terms of keepers I feel like I don't I don't know 100% if what we did here what we've shown you is a keeper but I think this is as close as I would say we could get to having a lab be a keeper because it's really the the one major thing that they're lacking is the actual like setting up of equipment but every knob and button and stuff that they would turn they're still turning it's just they're you know there's a piece of glass in front of them instead but you know I I feel like I would have a hard time imagining like a pendulum lab or something that would be, you know, uh, some remotified version that you could do online that would be a keeper. But I think like this kind of black, these are already kind of black boxes for the students anyways. So I feel like we didn't obfuscate anything too much for that. Um, then also I wanted to add one thing where we don't know that we, we don't have the expertise here to figure this out what we are interested in so if anyone knows anyone we'd like to like kind of try to understand the educational outcomes of using these things versus an in-person lab for you know anyone in particular or for students generally uh but the, you know that's kind of uh opaque to us But I think it would also be nice to discuss some of the other things that are done with remote labs, like uh, the this is for the spring quarter of a three quarter sequence, and the other two quarters, which are mechanics and ENM, we went to having the students work with stuff at home, and I'm wondering what you all did and 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 how it worked out for you all. If you if you would still do that, like have them do stuff at home. I mean, they'll be doing stuff at home in our officially online classes that are part of the online university, so to speak. I don't think we would do that for the regular students. I mean, I, I know our lab director would strenuously object to the idea. Let's put it that way. This, uh, this uh, phone that students now have, you can set up quite a few measurements that they can do at home quite well. We're just starting this. We haven't done a lot with it yet, but it's, yeah. And you can even combine it with stuff that happens online on the screen and stuff that they do, that they can set up at home with stuff that they have around and then use of like Firefox or something to, make the measurements. So there, there's opportunities if somebody thinks about it. <laughs> yeah, we used Firefox. Did anybody else? Yeah, Firefox was great. Um, the, the number, the amount of effort they put in making it really nice, easy to use, good interface, lots of suggestions for, for labs and interactions. Although I think it did ha also have the effect of, of scaring my students into all the data that could be tracked about them with, based on their, where their phone is and what their phone is doing at any given time. <laughs> One thing my, we found my students really liked it a lot when we were much less scripted. So like we told them, go measure the friction, the coefficient of static friction. Here's a little presentation. Remember how you did this in your lecture class, something sliding on something else as a function of the angle. Uh, you can try and get it 
the coefficient of static friction by where it slips. You can try and get at the coefficient of kinetic friction by how quickly it accelerates when it's darted to slip. And that was all we told them. So it wasn't quite so step-by-step step like our typical lab guides are. And they really liked it. It was a little bit more clear to them what they were supposed to write about in their notes. And they went, some of them went, you know, through many iterations of improving their experiment. And I thought that was really good. Something that we don't tend to give them in the sort of limited three hour period and half a lab desk when they are in person. But I don't it's know how to do it. We did something similar and initially they didn't like it at all. They said, what am I supposed to do? But we had this discussion forum and it was just coming up. I mean, they were just chatting and we had like over 300 comments on the lab and then they started helping each other. And then maybe they, well, they got it done and they got it done well, but initially they didn't like it at all. They want the cookbook or something. <laughs> I have yet to um, to be successful at this, but one thing I've been thinking about was taking a lot of the, the basic demonstrations I do for intro mechanics and turning them into some type of, of pre-lecture take-home lab where we tell the kids, you know, go experiment with something rolling down a hill and make some observations and get some intuition that's built up from some at-home investigation and then follow that up the next time we're in, in lecture that then I can draw on, on that experience. And I know that everybody has that common experience um, and it, it can kind of reinforce that intuition that I'm trying to, to, to build up. So, Mark, did you ask me to speak? You were muted if you did. You're still muted. <laughs> You're still muted. Okay, all right. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. My, uh, my girlfriend is a middle school math teacher, and she tries to start off as many of her lectures as she can with what she calls, well, what do you notice, what do you wonder? And she, she will, you know, present some small problem uh, that, you know, can maybe grow into a big problem if you, the more you think about it but it's kind of accessible to everybody. And she'll say, you know, okay, here's, you know, uh, like she'll draw a picture and say, okay, how many triangles are in this shape that I've drawn and how can you prove it or something like that? And then, you know, she'll say, what do you notice? What do you wonder about this? And kind of have this discussion. Um, and then that kind of evolves into kind of a more methodic way of going through some math topic. And I kind of wanted to start a club like that here that I want to just call what do you, the what do you notice, what do you no, wonder club or something, where we take our, our demos that we do and just let let show it to a student, then let them mess around with it for an hour and then try and ask them, okay, can we, can we quantify any of those things that you're wondering about? Like, how do we actually turn this into a measurable thing that we can, you know, do physics and science with? I think that, that both of those ideas are great, like the, I think having students mess around with it and then join is an excellent idea. And I like the idea of it as an accompaniment to lectures, but we don't have that luxury. We never get our actual lab class synced with the lecture very well. So I don't know how that works for the rest of you. Well, as we, we round out the hour here, is there, I wanna make sure we, we hit a, a topic here. Is there, is there a tool that you discovered that we didn't talk about yet, kind of in this big category, that is just an indispensable tool now that you will never go back to not using it? Admittedly, it's I, my, my iPad and pen, like this, I don't know. It's changed the way I do notes. It's changed the way I distribute notes. It's pretty basic though. It's not very inventive. Uh, and I could have been doing it 10 years ago. Uh, so 
to me, uh -huh. the most important tool was giving a small part, making the, using the discussion forum, a small part of the class participation credit. Once that became part of the class participation credit, everybody started using it initially at, at least for the credit. I, I was, the big classes was for life sciences. So they very <laughs> points oriented. And after they started using it, it suddenly became a really useful tool. They noticed the value in it and they started using it enormously. I had way, way more class participation in the online than I ever had in actual class. And it was only because it started with that you got class participation credit for using the discussion forum. Which forum did you use? I initially, I used Piazza and that work didn't work out because it didn't integrate with Canvas. So I just used the Canvas discussion forum, but we made categories under which they had to post different things. They could make their own categories. But it was like every week you had to make a contribution to a certain module and then it just took off. It just took off. Yeah, actually, I'll rephrase my answer. I think Slack is the one thing that I've discovered that um, has changed the way that my students interact with each other and me. Uh, that uh, my students really got way into that. And, and you know, I, I wake up in the morning and it's now my habit to check the Slack channel to see what was the 2 a.m. conversation about physics between my students, uh, which is really interesting. And, and um, it really helps inform me what I need to cover and what I need to talk about. And uh, it's it's interesting, and the the fact that that I can do that when I want to, and not have to respond to them at two a.m. when they want to, uh, is also beneficial. Zach or Rafi? Uh, yeah. So one thing uh, I noticed, uh, actually outside of the labs, but in another space. So we have a physics study room here that uh, is obviously closed during the pandemic. And it was something that was very difficult to remotify and ultimately kind of became something else, uh, more so office hours that are virtual that the students appreciate. But um, I'm getting off topic. The, the thing I wanted to mention is that a, a group of undergrads created a Discord for the physics department. And Discord, for those of you that don't know what it is, is, is functionally similar to Slack, um, but a little more open, I guess. You don't have to like invite people per se. And based on my feedback from the students, they love the Discord. Like, and then a lot of the TAs, and we have undergraduate tutors, a lot of them are on the Discord, and it's not something that's required by the department at all or for their positions. And they just, you know, if they have a question, they can just study with their friends and just ask their question. They don't have to be on this Zoom interaction for an extended period of time if they don't want to. So. That's something that I think yeah, is yeah. worth considering. Yeah. And then for me, I think the one that thing that I got was GitHub. I don't know if anyone has used that, but just being able to track a document through its life and make changes only in increments was, you know, for all the work that we were just showing you was a lifesaver. But we also found it good for just even writing lab manuals and giving other people access to lab manuals. GitHub was amazing. Um, and there was a question about tutoring, I assume, in response to what I was saying. Um, basically, we have um, uh, we have learning assistants uh, in our section. So we have lectures and then the sections that the grad students run. Um, and basically, we have undergrads that work with the grad students in their sections. And so the student-teacher ratio is essentially triple compared to what it has been in the past. And so it's like a it's complicated. Well, it's not super complicated, but like um, we basically break up the students into groups and then the undergrads also hold office hours virtually and they use like the virtual whiteboard and, you know, their tablets that they have or document cameras. And that's how we kind of got undergrad tutors going. Drew, you have a comment? Uh, my answer is indirectly related to your question. So you know, we always have students turn homework in on paper and we grade it. Well, now, of course, they're turning it online. So I took someone's suggestion to come to these meetings about having them grade their own homework. 
And so they had a deadline to submit their homework that you know we would check. But then they, after that, I would post the solutions immediately. And then they had 48 hours to grade their own homework and resubmit it. And so when they regraded it, I mean, I gave them some guidelines for what, you know, what zero through five meant on the problem. But they also had to add comments like on this page, I mixed up coordinate systems, I mixed up whatever, and write little paragraphs about what was wrong. And it was an extremely small class. But let me just very quickly show you what they thought of it. Assuming everyone can see that. These are all six students' comments, which could have been good or bad, but they all basically said about the same thing. Yeah, enough times in the past I've like, you know, with our course management system, we can see who looks at stuff. Students don't always realize that, right? But you're like the day of the test and not even half the class has looked at your homework solution that you spent hours writing, you know? And so, you know, I, I basically forced them to look at them. I was a little bit concerned that some of them might complain about having more work to do, so to speak, but at least none of these six did. I mean, they're all physics majors. Uh, I, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned about trying this with, in, you know, in a, you know, freshman, freshman class, basically. Uh, partly because whether they can judge you know, what their mistake is, also whether they might try to grade themselves too high, you know, because I didn't, I'd end up checking their work. And once in a while, they would overestimate their grade, but it was more because they didn't realize that what they did was wrong. Uh, but, but it worked really well for this small class of physics majors. So I'm going to keep doing that, uh, you know, post-pandemic, I think. Uh, and they seem to like it. So at least for the physics majors, it seems like a good idea. I can't be sure about a class of freshman engineers, but I'm, I'll, I'll try it at some point, so. I'd love that idea. <clears throat> How, um, did you have just kind of one blanket rubric score, you know, zero to five for every homework or did you go through and each part? They had to, uh, each problem was five points. So, and that was, that was the other good thing about it. Cause when I would grade the homework myself, the TA would grade it, we never have time to grade all the questions. So just a fraction of them would get graded. This way, they had to grade every single one. And I would just casually check to see that what they did was sort of OK. You know, once in a while, I'd catch something that they, yeah, you thought your version was also right, but actually yours is wrong because, and I would add that. But you know, so it didn't necessarily save me any time grading. It was about the same work on my part. But, it, but they were forced to actually go through it, which half the time they never do. So I think. But every, every single problem is worth five points, whether it was an easy problem or a hard one, they were just all five points. So, and yeah, so I'm going to keep trying it. I'm going to see if I can get some more other faculty to, to do it as well once I bug them about it. So, all right. Any other important keepers that you've discovered? As we're we're about coming to the end of our conversation. All right. Well, I hope you you keep thinking about this. You know, the we all made it through this last fourteen months, and that through a lot of effort and a lot of innovation, and. Uh, you know, there has to be parts of that that are are worth keeping. There has to be things that 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 drive more innovation and more creativity, and, and are going to keep going. Uh, so I, I hope you you don't look at the last you know 14 months and walk away and and just uh, wash your hands of it and and don't think about it ever again, uh, because you worked really hard and you did great things, and you you should uh, you should remember some of the things that you did. Um, I think I Raymond has a comment, right? Yes, Raymond, were you raising your hand? No. Oh, sorry. All right, um, so have a great two weeks. We'll be back uh, at the earlier time two weeks from today. Um, by the way, uh, an, one thing I'm, I'm trying to organize is uh, about a year ago, we had a student panel where it was ask student questions and get honest feedback from people, students that weren't yours. Um, <laughs> uh, but if you have students that you think might, might be interested in participating in that, 
please send me an email or or um, uh, something like that because I, I'm trying to put together a student panel to have this conversation. And it was a great conversation last year, and and I'd like to to do it again. And and I mean that from from uh, high school students to undergrads to you know first year physics students to seniors and physics majors about to graduate and go off into the real quote real world. Uh, you know, the whole gamut. Uh, it was great to have that as, as a group. So if you've got people that you think would be great for a panel like that, please um, drop me an email. You're, you just want students to talk about what worked online and what didn't, right? Or, yes, generally what worked okay. online and what didn't, um, okay. things like that. Uh, kind of a, a student reflection for the year of, of now a, a full two semesters of pandemic learning uh, versus a year ago, it was just a couple months. But with that, I, I bid you adieu and uh, hope everyone has a great two weeks. Well, good evening. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Deborah, for sharing. Oh, she, she's gone. <laughs> Very interesting stuff. Goodbye. Remark on the length of the videos. I can't remember what the exact number was, but it was something like after 